Hello, we are at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and this is the already traditional educational change sauna. I'm sitting here today with uh, two of my students, uh, um, Alexis from South Africa, right? Well, not exactly, but I'll, I'll be representing South Africa in today's conversation. Oh, okay, wonderful. <laughs> and Simon, you are definitely from Australia. Australia and originally England, but 10 years in Australia. Yeah. Okay, could you say something about what you do? Yeah. Sure. So I'm a part-time student in the International Education Policy Tract at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I work full-time in communications and social media at Northeastern University. Okay. And, um, yeah, so my name's Simon Tanley. I'm on the Mind Brain Education course here at Harvard, and that's studying how uh, neuroscience can affect the learning process. Good. Thank you very much for joining joining me here. We have been um, looking at today in today's class the, the issue of you know how we how we can transfer ideas from one place to another and uh, uh, particularly the work uh, that the the World Bank and the OECD are doing in this uh, this field. And my first first question to you both would be that if you think about the, the South 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 Africa in, in your case, Alexis and uh, Australia. Uh, in, in, in your case, what are the things, what are the issues that keep your ministers awake at night in education? So in South Africa there are persistent and profound gaps between the, um, the richest and poorest quintiles and so the richest South Africans have a vastly different educational experience than the poorest South Africans and the poorest South Africans are predominantly black. So that and a bunch of lawsuits, I'm sure, is keeping the education minister up at night, um, and also just the continuing impact of HIV and AIDS on orphans and other vulnerable children and also their families. Does, let me ask you this, does uh, South Africa has a, one system of education or the different provinces, different parts have their own unique systems? So education is managed on the provincial level. Um, there are public schools that the vast majority of South Africans go to, but there are also private schools that richer South Africans will typically um, opt into. In Australia, I know that the many politicians they stay awake uh, all night anyway. <laughs> but what, what's what's happening in education? Um, I echo uh, about South Africa in that um, one of the biggest issues that they should be uh, keeping awake at a night is the indigenous people. Um, issue with education and all their policies, to be honest. It's a, it's a huge and very much unsolved uh, issue with Australia. The pro probably the issue that will keep them awake at the moment, though, is the introduction of the Australian curriculum. They're just, um, after a long um, introduction, it is finally going to practice the, the national curriculum for Australia. Um, Australia is, is based on states and territories, and they've always been very, very independent uh, educationally. But this is their first um, go at really unifying what they do, and that's a very big challenge. Okay. Um, do you see any similarities between South Africa and Australia, other than uh, provincial, state level administration of education? That's an interesting question. I am. Um, I was recently focusing actually on the connection between South Africa and Brazil to jump to a different country right. and the. Southern Hemisphere. So that was an interesting example of Brazil being a bit further ahead in their education reform measures, and um, the OECD has highlighted them as a country that is um, making dramatic strides. And so I think South Africa has a lot to learn from a country like Brazil. Is there anything like Australia in the world? Oh wow, what a question. <laughs> um, that's that's a difficult one. The, in terms of uh, educational in makeup of the country, it is it is quite unique because it's a, a nation of of immigrants. The, the immigrant population, including myself, is is huge and it's always changing. There's been waves of European immigration, uh, Greeks, Italians, particularly, and English, uh, and then there's waves of Chinese and now waves of Indian as well. And um, Australia really wants to be a country which um, represents the whole world, really. And they're debating at the moment. You know, as always, what what is uh, what is what, what is it to be Australian? Right. And a lot of that comes through the schooling. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things I often hear here in the United States that is also kind of a unique and, and large and, and state-based uh, entity. Uh, people are saying that there's nothing the United States can learn from anybody else because it's so different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I I know the situation a little bit in, in both of these countries, but. 
is there is there anything that South Africa or Australia could learn from any other place in the world in education? Any innovations or ideas that you think would be useful to be looked at a little bit closer in these these countries? We I was certainly very interested in when we learned about Alberta mm. and the Canadian model, which is, seems to be very sort of proud of its maintaining its state education, and um, and that's something that. There's some, there's some very good states in Australia with very successful education systems being recognized, like Victoria, where I'm from, New South Wales particularly, very, very established. And will they, will the introduction of a national education policy um, actually affect lower those standards in those states or hold them back while we you know, support uh, and bring up other states? Right. That's right. a hard question. I'd say um, not to suck off Posse, but um, Finland and models of um, wraparound health service, I know, it's the worst. Um, wraparound health services, I think, are, are really um, an important model for a place like South Africa con to consider when they have such profound um, issues with public health. Um, I worked in microfinance there for a few months, and you can see the challenges in terms of rural populations, getting places, safety. Um, the health delivery challenges and the education delivery challenges and the financial service delivery challenges are all intertwined. So it's hard to separate one um, sector from another in a lot of ways. Right, right. Is, is there anything you think that the, the states or provinces can learn from one another? Or, in, in for example, I'm, I'm curious about Australia because, as you said, that there's a there's a quite a bit of differences between yes. like Victoria or New South Wales. Uh, is there is there any kind of a learning or exchange going between the uh, these entities? I, I would say so, and that's hopefully a real benefit of working together. It will be it's the collaboration is hard and hard to get going. But for instance, New South Wales, Victoria, very traditional, based on European models. Queensland, very successful and very real in, um, emerging sort of population in Queensland. They have a not they don't have an exam system there. It's all sort of coursework based, which it's been shown to be really successful in the same standards as the, the ones that have very tough exams. So we could actually learn from that, that exams um, are not the only way to, you know, for, for success. So it's, it's little stories like that I think we can learn from each other, as long as, as long as states listen. Yeah. Is there anything you can say about what's happening in, uh, in South Africa? You know, it's a little less of my area of expertise. I'm sure. much more interested in the, the microfinance and the health um, angle. But um, maybe some of our followers out there can weigh in on that issue. So we have a Twitter hashtag there going on with the, uh, with the course. So you, can, you can post your responses if you have any. Any, any reactions of what we were discussing today or previously? related to educational change? Well, I have a question for you, Sure. based on a quote that you gave in class today, okay. so don't be afraid. Um, <laughs> but you had said, um, if you're afraid of regrets, never write anything. So I just thought it would be fun to hear from you about what your advice for mi minimizing inevitable online regrets when it comes to what you put out there. Um, well, that's a tough, that's a difficult question. But you know, sometimes it happens to me that I, I want to tweet something and I type it in and then I leave it there for a moment and, uh, you know, it so happens that I just delete it, take it away. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, um, I follow my kind of my instinct in this, uh, is what you say. I have one, one principle in, in, in the working with the so, through social media is that I, I never tweet anything about my personal, my own life. I never post any photographs of myself or my family. Uh, that can be can be helpful, and I never say anything, any statements about other people. Uh, I think social media is a fair, unfair kind of a uh, medium to to uh, criticize people. If you want to, if you have something to say to somebody, say it like here, but not, not use it in the social media. So I think you you know as soon as you have a kind of a rough guidelines for yourself, what to do, and uh, you follow your ethics, uh, I think it's gonna be uh, gonna be good. My question to you was actually a um, slightly different tack, but I was reading um, a report about the state of Victoria, and um, back in 2004, Richard Elmore had been a big um, advisor for the state and put in, uh, worked on a sort of a whole load of strategies that, as an as a employee of Victoria, really thought worked. And the OECD did a report in 2007 and said, fantastic, mm -hmm. like really world-class system. And there was a few challenges, 
but it, it, it finished with the phrase, where does Victoria look, where do you look now if you are world class, you know, if you're actually cutting edge? Where, where do you go from that? And, and how do you actually develop? And I guess Finland might be in a similar situation. Yeah, exactly. I think, the, the, first of all, this is a great question. And I, I think, um, you know, if anybody who is asking this question is thinking that there is one place in this planet, if there's one country, one education system, I, I think it's probably a kind of a limited way of thinking about this thing. Well, the, the kind of advantage that we have right now is that we have so much data through the OECD and, and many other uh, sources that can help us to see, kind of, kind of a create a, a set of trends that are common in, in different parts of the world. And you know, if, if the education systems are able to do well um, in a very different cultural and economic settings, like you take some of the Asian systems or North America or Nordic countries, um, then I think there's much more power in these lessons that you can you can bring in to Victoria or any other place if you can say that this is something that seems to be working uh, throughout these successful education systems rather than say that this is a Finnish way of doing this thing or this is the Canadian way uh, that, that may, may or may not work in, in, um, in Victoria. But as you say, that Finland is, is in, a, in a similar situation now that um, you know, the world-class system, everybody praises Finland, but something needs to be done. We need to look for inspiration, and I, I think that that's why we had our minister here a few weeks ago, and and uh, she was she was traveling here and in in you know all parts of the world to you know look for inspiration, look for partners, and, and look for ideas how we can move together from where we are now to the future. And uh, probably this is one of the one of the ways to think about, including the state where we are now, Massachusetts, which is a belongs to this high-performing set of Victoria, Finland, uh, Alberta, uh, other places, that, you know, by coming together and having a dialogue among ourselves uh, about what we need to do is probably better than just try to find solutions from one country or one place. Mm. I wanted to ask you a question, um, speaking of ethics, what your experience or what advice you have for someone going in as a consultant in an education system and when that education system or that government has values or priorities that are vastly different from your own? Uh, yeah, it's, I think this is a kind of a practical situation where many people, uh, many consultants uh, end up uh, finding themselves. You know, successful consultancy is always based on certain degree of cultural literacy and sensitivity so, so that you understand the differences and you understand that, you know, some things that may be right and good within your own set of values and, and frameworks of ethics. It may not be the same in, in another place. I know some consultants who do not have this kind of a li level of, of literacy that they would be able to identify these things and you know it often happens that these, in, in these situations don't end up very well because you, you cannot really impose the things from your own experience, your own uh, systems, or your own models, unless you understand what's, uh, you know, where the uh, where the problem lives or where the challenge is uh, in the first place. So it's a, you know, consultancy is a is a, is a form of art. Any final comments? We have a, a few more seconds left. So if you want to uh, close this uh, wonderful sauna conversation, you have a chance to do it right now. Who are you rooting for? In terms of your your team. Oh, in terms of who I uh, Australia. That's right. Australia is my home. Okay. Good place. One recommendation for your own um, your own educational leader, own minister. Just one thing that they should consider that you have learned here. Uh, equity. Focus on equity. Australia, particularly, is a country born. Um, out of equity, and I think that should be the biggest priority in all. So take Donsky seriously. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And That's I think getting ahead of the reform agenda as opposed to being reactionary to um, lawsuits, for example, or problems that are being um, brought to the minister's attention. Should we keep health in within education agenda? Definitely. It should be in everyone's agenda. Wonderful. This is a good good time to close this sauna. Alexis, thank you very much. Simon, thank you very much. I wish you a very happy spring. Thank, Thank you so you. much. See you next time.